From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Perling, Mr. Dollar. I want to talk to you. Hello, Mr. Perling. Mr. Aimwell tells me you're in his office looking into my private affairs. If investigating the matter I came here for involves your private affairs, I guess I did that. I should be irritated, I suppose. And I guess I'm not. When can I see you? Most any time. How about today? I'll be at my house all day long. Tonight. And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. <music> Item 9, 10 cents, one phone call to Morton Scottman, advising him that Jeannie Perling had been located in New Orleans by one of Aimwell's operatives. Mr. Scottman thought that over for a while and then assumed it would be in the best interests of Eastern liability to make certain this was the truth. I told Mr. Scottman I intended to do just that. Item 10, $5, cab fare from the New Western Hotel to the home of David Perling. Hi. Come on in. The man who opened the door wasn't a servant. He wore a dark blue double-breasted suit. He smelled of cigars and bourbon, and private detectives stuck out all over him. He jammed a pudgy finger in the general direction of what later turned out to be the library, and I followed. The room we went into was empty, except for us. As far as I could see or hear, the rest of the house was empty, too. The man in the blue suit sat down on a leather sofa and pointed to a quart of bourbon that had just come out of a sack. You must be this dollar guy, huh? Yeah. Mr. Perling will be along in a minute. He asked me to say hello to you. Uh, by the way, my name's Brad Copeland. I'm one of Niles' men. Niles, ain't well? That's great. Where is Niles? Uh, he's with Mr. Perling. I'll be along. Sit down, relax. They said they thought it was about time for a little conference. What for? The girl's been found, hasn't she? Oh, sure, sure. Now they got to figure some other things out. I'll bet. You don't believe much of this, do you? Nope. Well, then I'll put it this way. I'm the guy who found Jeannie Perling. How about it now? Okay. Look, I got put on this thing because an insurance company executive thought Perling might have had a false death report made on him to juggle some things in the stock market. Oh, that story in the papers about Perling dying, huh? Yeah, Perling paid to have that story printed, all right. But not for any stock market angles. He did it to try and scare up this daughter of his who scrammed away from home a year ago. Now, I found that hard to believe, even after I talked to Niles Aimwell and he told me the agency had been hired to find the girl a year ago. I suppose you're one of the men who's been looking. Yeah, that's about it. No luck, either. And yesterday morning comes a phone call. I don't know who it is. Tells me where she's living, what name she's using in New Orleans. I scram down there by plane and check it out. It's all true. So I come back here, and here I am. Conference. You found her on a tip from somebody you don't know? Man or woman? Always a man's voice. Wonderful, ain't it, what happens sometimes? How does it look to you? Like a sealed freight car full of nothing. That's the girl down there, and you owe all right. I manage that. I picked up a prince and checked him with what we had to go on. But what's what, I don't know. What's Amal going to do now? That's why the conference. We see what we'll see. Relax. I tried to do that, but I didn't do very well. Copeland settled to his bourbon, and I picked up and laid down a half a dozen magazines, smoked two cigarettes, paced up and down. Finally, I heard a door open somewhere, and Niles Amwell and David Perling walked in the room. Then Aimwell motioned Copeland to his feet, and both of them left the room without a word. David Perling and I were alone. How much do they pay you, Dollar? Oh, I'm paid well enough. What's that got to do with it? I was just curious, is all. You seem like a competent man. As a matter of fact, the most competent I've met, and that includes Mr. Aimwell and Mr. Copeland. By the way, I, I just fired them. Really? I don't think I need them anymore, now that I know where Jeannie is. Oh, You've had an extraordinary interest in my affairs lately. I'm willing to bet that you won't leave me alone until you're satisfied about my daughter. You'd be right. I want Jeannie to come home. Here, where she belongs. Why don't you go get her? I, uh, I think that might be difficult under the circumstances. I'm afraid she bears considerable rancor for myself and Mrs. Perling. 
Perhaps someone like you could, uh, well, persuade her that it would be the best thing to do. I go down to New Orleans and get her? Exactly. I was going anyway. Oh? Why? Well, offhand, you don't seem like the father who's happy to know that his daughter, whom he hasn't seen or heard from in a year, is alive and well. You haven't made a move to go and pick her up yourself. Also, she was found too soon and too fast after I got in on the picture. <laughs> hey, you can stop right there. I'm sure I wouldn't even attempt to explain any of those things. I didn't think you would. Or could. Hmm? I'm on my way to New Orleans, Mr. Perling, to get your daughter. I think she'd be crazy if she came back here, but I'll take it up with her. Do that. I wonder if you'd like to try to explain something else for me. What? Why you were feeding me out a couple of minutes ago to see if I'd buy off. Get out of here. Get out. Why not? Expense account item 11, $113.15. Airfare, incidentals, New York to New Orleans, Louisiana. The temperature was exactly 28 degrees hotter when I landed. In the cab from the field, I peeled off my coat and loosened my tie and took off my hat. I walked into the lobby of the Roosevelt Hotel that way. Everyone else seemed cool enough in linens and tropicals. Everyone except myself and a big blonde giant of a man leaning against the CNS ticket counter. Boy, take Mr. Dollar to 511. The giant smiled when he saw me and stuck out his hand. Well, well, well. I'm certainly glad to see you. We, we thought you'd never get here. Hope you had a pleasant trip. Uh, I was okay. I know you're tired and hot and would like to wash up a little and refresh yourself, but... The rest of the boys are headquartered in 810. They're mighty anxious to meet you. Mighty anxious. Us Delta cotton growers are going to make it or break it at this convention. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. We sure are, aren't we? Uh, as soon as you're cleaned up, you come right over. We have a drink and I'll show you around the town. Yeah, that'll be swell. 810? 810. Uh, about an hour? About an hour. Uh, I'll see you. Hey, clerk. Yes, sir? How long have the Delta Cotton Growers been in town? Delta Cotton Growers? Well, they had their convention last month, sir. Who's registered in 810? We have no 810, sir. I'd done someone dirty. When he came over with hand out in front, I was supposed to say, you got the wrong fellow, my name's Dollar. But I made him play it out for a particular reason. He wanted to know who I was, and he didn't quite know. But then I wanted to know who he was, and I didn't quite know. I wanted to know him because of that 38 strapped under his left arm. It bulged out just enough to make me curious. By 7.30, I'd eaten dinner and found an address on Ursuline Street, the address where Jeannie Perling was living. A mailbox carried that name. It was one of those unpainted apartment houses in the French Quarter, full of heat and low-watt light bulbs. The girl who opened the door was a medium-sized blonde, and she wore a black dress. The girl I was looking for had cold black hair. Yes? How do you do? My name's Johnny Dollar. I came here to see Jeannie Perling. Come in, please. You're a friend of Jean's? In a way. I just came from New York. You know her father, then? Yes. Oh. I'm Janice Floyd, Jean's roommate. This way. Careful, it's a little dark. Sure. Maybe I had the feeling when I saw the black dress... But I knew I had it when Janice Floyd turned and led me through the two large rooms that made the apartment. I thought that was the end of it, but there was one more room. The blonde girl stood to one side so I could see in. The perspiration began to trickle down my face. I knew what was coming. Here she is, Mr. Dollar. She was there, all right. As lovely and as young and beautiful as the picture. There was a candle burning at her head and feet. And she was dead. I don't know how long I stood there in that dark room staring down at her. I think there were other people in there, too. Dark people, heads bowed, hands folded in front of them, all looking at her. How did it happen? Leukemia. You know, didn't you know her very long? No. No, as a, as a matter of fact, Miss Floyd, I, I didn't ever know her. I, uh, I certainly didn't know she was dead when I came here tonight. I, I hardly expected... She it. asked that it be this way. But who are you? I'm an insurance investigator. 
From her father? Not exactly, no. Oh, yes, I see it now. You aren't the first one who's been here looking for her. There have been others, detectives and lawyers trying to get her to go back. What? If he'd loved her, if they'd loved her for just one unselfish moment, she would still be there. Well, Mr. Dollar, she's where her father can't bother her anymore. You tell him that when you go back to New York. Tell him he can stop hiring lawyers and detectives to find her. Now get out. Expense account item 13, $5, the usual charge in any city for having a legal document copied and photostatted. A death certificate verifying the fact that the girl had died on the 20th day of the month. A medical report attached to the certificate named the cause of death as leukemia. I had copies of all these legal documents by 10 o'clock the following morning. I even went through the motions of phoning the desk and asking for a bill and making a plane reservation for that night. I had a feeling someone would be very interested to see me take care of all those things, and I was right. The big blonde man with the 38 happened to be in one corner of the lobby when I paid my bill. He also happened to be at the airport when I picked up my ticket, but then he got careless. I walked through the gate, waited two minutes, and slipped back to grab a cab in front, just in time to see him wheel a battered convertible out of the parking lot and head back for town. I followed in my cab. He went to the Ursuline Street address. Two minutes later, he came out. Expense account, item 14, $8. I let my cab go and strolled up to him just as he was getting in his car. Hi, Ed. Uh what? Look, we've been playing games long enough, don't you think? Well? Why don't you go back to New York and do what you have to do? Deliver this death certificate? I don't believe it. You saw her dead, didn't you? Still don't believe it. That's too bad, because that's the way it is. He got in his car, started it up, drove away. I stood there and watched him go. Money, I kept saying to myself. Money. There's money in it somewhere. Plain old money. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there's still money in it. More money than it takes to save a life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson... It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the final episode of this week's story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>